Hello everybody, this is uh, Davide Falessi, the multimedia editor of Libre Software, and today I have the pleasure to interview the editors of the uh, special issue on programming languages, which uh, will be uh, featured in the September-October 2014 issue of IWE Software. And the editors are Larry Tratt, who is an academic at the Department of Informatics within the School of Natural and Mathematical Science at King's College London, and uh, Adam Welk, who is the principal member of technical staff at Oracle Labs uh, in the Virtual Machine Research Group in uh, California. So welcome, Larry, and welcome, Adam. Hello. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let's start uh, uh, introducing the topic of programming language uh, and describe uh, what uh, is this issue about. Well, um, programming languages are uh, obviously a very huge and important area. I mean, they, we couldn't write all the software that we do without them. And um, interest in programming languages waxes and wanes. And sometimes we think we found the perfect programming language to solve all our problems. Uh, and then we find out it's not so perfect or there are some reasons why we want to use other languages. And I think we went through a long period where probably Java was the dominant language, and people thought every problem could be solved in Java. And now people are thinking, well, maybe there are some things where we would need other languages with different strengths to tackle different problems. And so what we're looking at in, in this issue is, where are we going to go next with programming languages? Um, what languages might evolve? What is the tooling around languages possibly going to change into? Um, what's the next step forward in programming, in a sense? Great. So, Adam, do you do you have anything to add, or shall we go ahead with the second question? I think Laurie has been uh, pretty comprehensive. I think that was uh, an awesome answer. I have nothing to add. Great. So, why do you think is uh, particularly timely, this topic? I mean, why is this important now? So, I, I think that that uh, there is a unique set of challenges that we are uh, facing right now, and maybe maybe we've been facing them for a little while, but certainly not you know not at the times when the first programming languages have been uh, developed or even you know like their followers. Uh, mainly, what I'm what I'm thinking is that um, it, we have tremendous changes in uh, the hardware that. Uh, Programs are being executed on, uh, and this, you know, this, been, this has been happening over the last, uh, I don't know, um, probably five to ten years. Uh, but it's becoming more and more important to be able to ad address these uh, uh, these challenges or these new architectures effectively. And uh, there has been a lot of changes in the programming languages uh, in the attempt to actually address address those problems. And I'm thinking mostly about the fact that parallelism is now an important uh, um, aspect of uh, programming platforms, uh, but also with the rise of the mobile, uh, you know, we have, we're facing challenges with, uh, you know, low power computations and how to actually cram all these uh, in interesting and complicated computations into small uh, form factors. Another thing that I think is what's making this uh, topic very important and very interesting right now is that programming languages are so widely used these days. You know, in the old times, uh, there was a handful of people that were programming these huge mainframes. And today, you have high school kids that are writing extremely complicated and useful pieces of, of software. And, you know, I think that uh, this is actually the time when a lot of people, really wide audiences, would be interested to find out a little more about the, the languages and the tools that they can use. I completely agree. Uh... So, uh, what do you think is the audience of uh, this special issue? So, are you targeting students, or are you targeting professors? Of, of course, the main audience of Azure Software is uh, uh, developers or practitioners. So, I mean, who should read and be interested in this special issue? Well, obviously, everyone should read it and be interested in it. But I'll be realistic and say that there are probably two main audiences that I think we will be aiming at. The first one is uh, current software developers, who I think will be interested to see some thoughts on uh, emerging technologies and techniques that may influence how they develop software in the future. 
The other one is for people maybe at a more managerial level um, who uh, will be wondering where will their organizations as a whole possibly be going. And they are often a little bit disconnected from the technical decisions. Uh, and this special issue may give them a little bit of an insight into what their developers are casting their beady eyes on as to the exciting tools that they'll be wanting to use in the future. Great. Uh, when uh, I have a problem with software engineering is that uh, I always see a uh, software engineering uh, domain as a way to take decisions. So uh, in this case, when I look at programming language, uh, the first thing that I uh, think about is, you know, how can I choose them? So uh, can you please specify some uh, criteria on which uh, people should choose or uh, if there is no uh, solid theory behind, I mean, how would you choose uh, the programming language to use? Well, uh, let me take that, let me take that question. Um, so I, I think that um, the domain that you are targeting is uh, probably one of the most uh, important, important criteria. Um, there are very general purpose programming languages in which you can, you know, imagine programming almost anything, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be convenient. So to give you a few examples, you can, you know, imagine writing uh, a database driver or, a, you know, sort of a little program that will access and manipulate uh, data that's stored in a database in, say, C or C++. But it wouldn't be super convenient. That's why there are domain-specific languages that are good at it, like SQL. So, you know, if you wanted to, to program a database or to get to manipulate data in the database, you know, that would be one of the main criteria for you, uh, for your choice of the language, it's which is more convenient and better suited for that. Similarly, if you, you know, had an application, for example, that was heavy on string manipulation, um, yes, you could, again, write it in C or C++ or Java, but, you know, languages, scripting languages like Python uh, are probably uh, better suited for that, for that purpose as well. So the main is, in my opinion, super important. Um, uh, the other um, uh, important thing is sort of what is your uh, target, um, sort of what are your target requirements? So some languages are good at, you know, writing, scripting, uh, prototyping very quickly, but are not very performant. So if you wanted to write, uh, you know, say um, an application that would have to run real fast or would have some, uh, you know, timing constraints or um, a power constraints, you would not write this application in, in a scripting language like uh, like JavaScript. Uh, this would require some special uh, specialized languages or, or languages that let you tap to sort of the the uh, real sort of low layers of the of the of the system, like operating system and hardware. So you would probably write it in C or or language that is a little bit like C. Um, so these two uh, are certainly important, and you know that. The scale of your of your project of the of the piece of software that you're writing is, I think, also very important because some languages are, are again good at writing you know little snippets of code that they execute you know infrequently um, uh, and do not necessarily co 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 collaborate with each other, uh, but are not so good at writing large pieces of software and you have multiple developers that write separate modules that uh, have to communicate with them uh, with each other uh, often and efficiently. Um, so, so in that case, you know, you would also that the, the choice of the language would be different because, for example, dynamically typed languages, as good as they are at what they do, uh, they may not necessarily be a, a excellent or ex an excellent choice for writing huge uh, projects like writing, you know, a new operating system. Oh, actually, who would write a, an operating system uh, and, and JavaScript? Maybe some people would, but it's, it seems like like it's not a very well suited language. Um, and what comes with that is also support for, um, you know, for writing code. So debuggers, uh, profilers, uh, these things are also increasingly more important when you write, you know, pieces of software that are large and, and, and you know, will be used by, by millions of users, rather than if you write yourself a little script that, you know, you just use on a single machine from time to time. So um, I think those criteria, you know, maybe they're not super uh, precise, but those criteria, I think, uh, would help in choosing which language to use for your specific project. Okay, very good. Uh, so, what do you think are the main uh, research directions? 
I think there are several. Um, I think we're looking at an era where performance has really come into its own again. So a lot of programming languages that were once thought as terminally slow, that there was never going to be any opportunity for them to go fast. Uh, those languages are now uh, really having a lot of effort put into their performance, and it's getting closer to more highly optimized languages of the past. And that means that you know, languages like uh, dynamically typed languages, um, some, some of the ones that Adam mentioned, are now performing pretty well, and their performance is increasing. There's still a lot of interesting questions to answer there. Some of those languages are very hard to optimize. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting is some of the tooling surrounding languages, so that um, we're not just using a, a basic text editor uh, anymore, that we've got potentially much richer tools to interact with the system, uh, to, with, with the programs that we're creating, to understand it, to augment it. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity there to really drag tooling into a new era. Okay. So is there uh, anything uh, at all you want to add before we close oh. the interview? I could maybe add a, a, a little bit to the uh, the research directions because I what I've been seeing recently is that uh, what's becoming sort of a focus of, of many people's research is what I would broadly call frameworks, and you know those frameworks they they sort of may have sort of different meaning in that for example there are frameworks that allow you to uh, implement multiple different languages while you're using uh, the same core components of uh, of the infrastructure, for example, you know, a, a machine or a compiler, and um, uh, there is a lot of interest around that. But frameworks are also things like, um, and we actually have a, an article about that on uh, in our special edition. Um, frameworks are also um, about tools, so uh, you know how to support multiple uh, or uh, multiple different languages. Um, within um, the same framework, within the same IDE, for example. This is also people are really interested in. So um, that's sort of my, my little two cents to uh, what Laurie already said about, about research directions. Uh, maybe I could just follow up on one thing that, that Adam said there, bringing out something actually from a couple of his previous answers. I think we're moving into a, a heterogeneous age of programming languages that people aren't just happy now to say, We'll use one language for everything we do. There, pe people are increasingly happy to say, well, this part of our task, language X is best suited to it, so we'll use X there. And in this part of our task, language Y is better suited, for whatever reason that that, that is. And they'll use language Y in that second part. So you're ending up with large systems with chunks written in different languages. And uh, there's a much greater acceptance that that's a reasonable and, and often sensible thing to do. That could, I think, lead to some very interesting uh, future directions because we're now looking at systems where they're not in a single language. Um, certainly, some of our research is looking at what happens when you mix languages together using some of the frameworks that Adam's mentioned. Um, we're in the very early days, but I think you'll see more and more of that sort of stuff happening. And again, some of the um, articles we have in the special issue touch on some of those factors. Wow. I'm very fascinated about this. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Lowry and Adam, uh, for presenting uh, the, your special issue on programming languages for the September-October 2014 IDBRA software issue. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.